the 1833 Book of Commandments introduction to Section 5, it says, A revelation given to Joseph and Martin in Harmony, Pennsylvania, March 1829, when Martin desired of the Lord to know whether Joseph had in his possession the record of the Nephites. Here's the backstory. Just over one year after Martin Harris had first traveled down from Palmyra to Harmony, Pennsylvania, and scribed for Joseph, he made another visit in March 1829. It had been nearly eight months since Joseph had last seen Martin under the heartbreaking circumstance of the loss of the Book of Lehi manuscript. Much had happened with Joseph since then, including receiving DNC 3, repenting a lot, being authorized to translate again, and receiving DNC 4 on behalf of his father. Having heard something of Joseph's success, Martin was eager to visit Joseph, perhaps in part to be reconciled over the disaster of the lost manuscript, but primarily to ask Joseph for help concerning a highly distressing situation back home in Palmyra. Here's the details. Martin told Joseph that some people in Palmyra had risen up and united against the work, gathering testimony from supposed witnesses against the plates. And according to Joseph's mother, the person at the heart of this opposition was Martin's own wife, Lucy Harris. Apparently, having heard of Joseph's efforts to translate again, Martin's wife determined to prove this delusion false once and for all, before Martin was swindled out of his money and others bought into Joseph's deception. Joseph's mother said that Martin's wife mounted her horse and flew through the neighborhood like a dark spirit from house to house, making diligent inquiry at every house for miles, where she had the least hope of gleaning anything that would subserve her purpose, which was to prove that Joseph had not the record which he pretended to have. Martin's wife was seeking for incriminating evidence that Joseph only pretended to have gold plates for the express purpose of obtaining money from those who might be so credulous as to believe him. In time, Mrs. Harris felt she had gathered enough witnesses to bring a lawsuit against Joseph, which would implicate her husband as well. Martin said that Joseph's antagonists told him they had testimony enough, and if I did not put Joseph in jail and his father for deception, they would me. In other words, if the plates were fakes, then Martin was one of Joseph Smith's guilty accomplices who would mislead the public into buying copies of the fraudulent translation. The threat was, if Martin didn't help them expose Joseph's fraud now, he would soon be taken down along with it. So now here Martin stood before Joseph in desperation. In all his scribal help the previous spring, Martin had never actually seen the plates. And although, after what he had seen, he believed they were real, he felt he now needed to actually know, with an absolute certainty, that Joseph truly had in his possession the record of the Nephites. So that's the backstory. Now let's dive into the Lord's response to Martin's request, which became DNC 5. The Lord began by telling Joseph to remind Martin that although Joseph had been commanded to testify of the Book of Mormon record, he had also entered into a covenant with God to not show the plates except to those persons to whom God commanded him to show them. Joseph was not to use his gifts to try to prove that the record was true. For now, he was only to use the gift God had given him to translate it. Later, the Lord said, Joseph would be ordained to go forth and deliver my words, meaning the words of the Book of Mormon, to the people of the world. And if they won't believe my words, the Lord says, then they would not believe you even if it were possible for you to show them the plates and the Urim and Thummim you've been entrusted with. In other words, the primary evidence for the authenticity of the Book of Mormon would be its message, not the physical plates. Seeing, in this case, would not necessarily lead to believing. In addition to the primary evidence of the Lord's message in the book itself, however, the Lord outlines a plan in verses 10 to 20 to reach out to an unbelieving generation with two supportive evidences intended to draw them to the primary evidence of the words of Christ. Number one, Joseph Smith, the one through whom the words of Christ would come to this generation, is the first supportive witness of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. This was also mentioned in verse two. And second, the Lord announces here that he intends to select three witnesses whose testimonies would accompany the words of Christ in the Book of Mormon. These three will gain unshakable testimonies of the Book of Mormon by way of heavenly declaration and by viewing the plates through the power of God. Their combined testimony will then be sent forth with the Book of Mormon itself out into the world. Thus, the supportive evidences of Joseph Smith's witness and the witness of these other three 
are intended to help people believe the words of Christ in the Book of Mormon. And for those who do believe His words, Christ here promises to visit them with a personal manifestation of His Spirit, which will lead to their spiritual rebirth. On the other hand, those who harden their hearts and reject the secondary evidence offered by these witnesses will be condemned by so doing and will not be protected from the destruction leading up to and attending the Lord's second coming unless they repent. In verses 21 to 22, Joseph is told to stay close to the Lord and to not yield to the persuasions of men. A timely reminder given that yielding to Martin's persuasions the previous summer was the cause of such deep pain and regret for Joseph in the lost manuscript episode. In verses 23 to 29, the Lord lays out the conditions for Martin to actually become one of the promised three witnesses of the Book of Mormon, the obligation he will then be under, and the dire consequence that will come to him if he breaks his covenant with the Lord. The conditions are these. If he will bow down before the Lord, humble himself in mighty prayer and faith, in the sincerity of his heart, repent of his sins, and covenant with the Lord to keep his commandments and be faithful to him, then the Lord will let him see what he desires to see. The obligation he will then be under is to testify and to say, I have seen the things which the Lord hath shown unto Joseph Smith, Jr., and I know of a surety that they are true, for I have seen them, for they have been shown unto me by the power of God and not of man. The consequence of denying this after the Lord has shown it to him is that he would become a covenant breaker and be condemned. The Lord next instructs Joseph that after translating a few more pages, he is to stop for a season until he's commanded to continue. He assures Joseph that he will provide means for him to accomplish the translation. This is likely a reference to a scribe the Lord was then preparing and whom he would send to Joseph the following month, a young school teacher named Oliver Cowdery. The references in verses 32 and 33 to those who lie in wait to destroy thee likely includes Martin's wife and those whom she has stirred up to bring the lawsuit against Joseph, as well as others with more deadly motives. Both Joseph and Martin have been warned in this revelation that if they do not carefully follow the Lord's instructions given here, Joseph will lose his gift and the sacred artifacts again, and Martin will fail to gain the witness he seeks and will fall into transgression. But if they are faithful to the Lord's commandments outlined herein, they will prevail over their cunning adversaries, play vital roles in the Lord's plan to bring an unbelieving generation to safety and spiritual rebirth, and be lifted up at the last day. The good news is, they both were faithful and received the promised blessings. Regarding the lawsuit, for instance, when Martin returned to Palmyra, he was called to testify in the trial his wife had brought against Joseph Smith. According to Joseph's mother Lucy, Mr. Harris testified with boldness, decision, and energy. She said, He raised his hand to heaven and said, I can swear that Joseph Smith never got one dollar from me since God made me. Besides fifty dollars I put into his hands for the purpose of doing the work of the Lord, and added that Joseph Smith has certainly never shown any disposition to get any man's money. Further, he said, And as to the plates which he professes to have, if you gentlemen do not believe it but continue to resist the truth, it may one day be the means of damning your souls. Perhaps a reference to section 5 verse 18. After Martin's testimony, Lucy said, The judge told them that they need not call any more of their witnesses, but to bring that which had been recorded of the testimony that had been given. This he tore in pieces before their eyes, and told them to go home about their business and trouble him no more with such ridiculous folly. And as for the promise of becoming one of the three witnesses, Martin worked for the next three months to meet the Lord's conditions for this blessing. And then finally in June, he, along with Oliver Cowdery, the forthcoming scribe, and a friend of Oliver's named David Whitmer, became the promised witnesses of the Book of Mormon. And that's the story of Doctrine and Covenants 5. 